we are at that last verse of the 23rd Psalm. We, we first remember that we are praised, we are provided by God, and, and He provides a path of righteousness. And then we go into that deep verse where it says, even when we walk through the valley in the shadow of death, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. And then we come back to God's righteousness again. And David ends with, surely, goodness and mercy. And I say the word will chase, pursue, chase me all the days of my life. And if I choose to, I add in, I'll dwell in God's house forever. It's as if the verse, the psalm, faith in God is almost too good to be true. Are you hearing me? Surely goodness and mercy are going to pursue me all the days of my life. That doesn't work. It doesn't seem like that. It's, it's what about the bills? What about the problems of life? What about depression? What about when things settle in? And surely goodness and mercy are going to follow me. They're going like, to chase me. And this is a man hiding from Saul's army writing this. It's too good to be true. I remember several years ago, I was pursuing, I was looking at buying. I, I actually did. We, we bought a newer vehicle. I was buying a newly used vehicle. And I was all around some dealerships kind of on the west side of the cities and on out Highway 12. And I looked at them and I got tired because the theme seemed to just rain. I would get to a vehicle that I was looking at and I'd be all about it. It was probably a vehicle with 40,000 miles on it just off of warranty. And I would ask the salesman, this particular time it was a male salesperson, and I would ask the salesman, does the air conditioning work? And without missing a beat, he said, it should. Oh, this gets better. And, and I said, does, does the power windows all work? Oh, it should. I'm, I'm starting to get a little fed up. Does the cruise control work? It should. Does the stereo system work? It should. Finally, I just was disgusted. I thought, do you work? It should. I'm not making that up. I did. I kept rolling. It should. It should. I, do you work? It should. I looked at him. What do you mean it should? You're a person. You're a human being. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you were asking you. And unfortunately, that's what we've become accustomed to in society. We go buy things, and we get them, you know, the new refrigerator, and wherever you buy them, Home Depot Best, oh, you want to get an extended warranty. Why? Because that way you'll pay more money so it'll be covered better. Well, what about the product I'm buying? Well, you still want to get an extended warranty. Everything's too good to be true. Don't we question that all the time, every time? And this psalm just kind of sticks out at us. Let's pray. And gracious God, we come before you today because sometimes, whether we want to admit it or not, even for the most optimistic of us, we question. We become pessimistic. And David throws out the end of a very well-known psalm across the world and says, surely goodness and mercy will follow us. And we question that. The truth be told, Lord, there are a number of us right now who question where is that goodness and mercy. And so, Lord, in the honesty of the question, Holy Spirit, not out of guilt, but complete grace, complete mercy, answer us today. Answer us in these few moments. Answer us in this worship. We just ask for that, Lord. We ask for that honestly. And open our eyes so we remove the doubt that the world brings so we can see the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Help the words of my mouth not be mine, but with humble gratitude and expectation, Lord, help us and me included hear you and let my words be yours. We ask this in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So we have that image of all that goes on today and does this work? It should. Does this work? It should. And we get in the middle of that and David is being chased by Saul's army. Remember? Because he's going to be ordained. He's going to be already chosen. He's already been chosen to be the next king. Saul is jealous. So he takes his army and he chases them to just kill him. And in the midst of being chased, and this is what I signed up for, Lord, I didn't know this. He writes this psalm and he ends with, sure Surely, goodness and mercy, that's compassion, shall follow me all the days of my life. And then he brings out that gift of eternity, both now and forever, if we choose Christ. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life. David's life was a train wreck. And I'll get back to that. I mean, at so many levels. And yet he began to understand at a younger age the train wrecks happen and mercy, God's compassion, is always chasing us. It's not, there's, there's nothing I can do to keep God from chasing me. I can choose to ignore him. I can even shake my fist. I can even call his name in vain. And I can look at him and say, God, I'm sure you're chasing me. Big deal. Because I'm not seeing you. And it is right there that you and I hit the crossroads of faith and doubt or faith and fear. And we have to look in those crossroads and say, what am I going to do? Am I going to look for God's mercy in the midst of the fact that my bills aren't meeting the finances at the end of the month? Or my depression is stronger than I'd like it to be? Or this um, relationship is a train wreck? Am I going to look for God's mercy in the middle of that? Or am I going to blind my eyes to God deliberately in spite of the mercy? That's really what it's about. Marcia came up and read some really neat scripture passage today. This is such a neat thing. It starts in John chapter 9 where Jesus heals a blind man. And then he tells the blind man to go report to the temple because that's how they reported healings. Much like we do charting at hospitals and nursing and all that and doctors. They reported their healings. They charted them at the temple. And they found out it was Jesus. And even though the blind man could see, they told the blind man, don't give credit to Jesus. If you give credit to Jesus for your healing, Healing, you are not allowed in the temple anymore in your life. So he just begins to see. His life is restored. He's got new life. And as soon as he goes to the temple to report it, he gets slapped in the face and says, if you give Jesus this credit, you're going to be a leper in our community the rest of your life. And then the, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Tell that to the blind man. And he goes in there, and then Jesus goes into chapter 10, and he starts talking to the Pharisees that don't want him to have credit, and they're right in the middle of a man-made festival at Marsha Red, the festival of dedication, the festival that was developed by men, by priests and Pharisees, about 170-some years before the life of Christ, before the life of Christ, to celebrate, get this, this is very interesting, the festival was meant to celebrate when God's Son, when God's Son would come to earth and cleanse, cleanse the temple in the middle of winter. It was in the middle of the winter months. It was man-made, uh, thought of and developed as a yearly festival um, in the middle of winter, right around this time of year, to, 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 to believe that Jesus is coming, that God's Son is coming. And in the middle of that festival, he's preaching in the temple, in the portico of Solomon. That's the entryway to the temple where everybody can be, not in the high priest's place. And he's trying to tell them, I am here. And you've got people who are deliberately saying, I'm not going to believe that. And at the end of this two-chapter marathon of conversation in that temple, the Jews gathered around and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, then tell us plainly. Have you ever been at that moment of God where you're so determined to prove God wrong, you literally turn and you say, God, I know you're wrong, prove it to me. And you get hugged with mercy and compassion.
I can remember times in grad school thinking, am I ever going to get done with this and wanting to quit and, and wanting to just drop out of grad school because it was too long. I'd been through college right into grad school and I was tired and everybody else was making money and my alumni, the, the, the others who were graduating were making some money and I wanted to quit. And I remember God saying, don't you quit on me. I have brought you this far. The sovereignty and the mercy and the compassion will bring you further. David's life was a train wreck. He murdered a lady's husband. He had two different children with that lady after he murdered the husband. One of them died. Then he had more children. And they turned against him eventually. And the kingdom got split up because of his choices. He had every reason to say, if there is a God, forget it. And yet he writes this verse and he believes it even in the train wreck of his life. And he yells out, I know that God's mercy is always chasing me. You know, that's the problem with us, me included. We, we keep running from God and God just keeps running towards us. We can't stop the mercy from loving us. And these people sit in the temple and they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? And the other answer gets really ugly. This is where it gets ugly. It's almost like Jesus is looking at the priests and he's saying to them, I have told you. I sent a blind man to you and you leperize him. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, I testify the healing of the blind man. They testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. It's really about what window we're going to look out of. I'm sitting in and working. I'm not sitting. I'm, I'm feeding um, people in Daytona Beach at Community United Methodist Church. And I'm going and taking groceries out to their car. And I'm putting it in their car. And it's apparent to me that they're living, as I shared last Sunday, they're living out of their car. They're living out of their car. I can't wrap around that. And, and yet they look at me. And I'm thinking, we got so much more to solve here, Lord. This is, this is not solving it. And they look at me and they hug me. Because all they want to do is give me mercy. Because I'm just an instrument of a church 10 years ago that figured out a way to start providing food for homeless people. And I realize I can't solve where they live today, but I can get mercy from them. And they say, bless you. And they want to know a little, little bit about Minnesota, but not much. Because it's very cold to them. <laughs> not a place they want to be living on in their car. I've asked Art and Julia, many that went to Daytona are not with us. Jeannie Ewall is, is part of Crosswinds United Methodist Church, and she shared there. And then Bruce and Diane have the audacity to stay in Daytona for the month of February. I don't get that, but they might come back. And No, they're coming back because I talked to their pastor. He's sending them back. But um, Art and Julie are here today, and they're going to share a little bit about the mercy, which which is compassion that they found in Daytona that week. Hi. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of mercies of God when we were there. Um, one of the things that comes to mind the most is when we got there, we had been told that all the lumber would be cut and would be in the, on the third floor ready for us to put together the bunks that they're making for the dormitory. Um, when we got there, there was lumber, and that was the mercy because I wouldn't have wanted to carry it up to the third floor. But it was not cut, it was not ready. Um, the tools that they had said that would be there were somewhat inadequate. But, and the other mercy part about that is we had two great carpenters and then some better carpenters and some, of course, of us who weren't carpenters at all. They made it all work and we got the jobs that we had planned on done and 
it was just really a good experience. And one other thing, because I had gone two years in a row, I got to meet some of the same people the second year. And I'm gonna share about just this one fellow. The first year, he was homeless and he was kind of helping another older gentleman that was partially blind and whatnot, but he was helping Mark. So Pete was there again this year. And I walked up to him and I didn't really know what to expect from him because the year before I maybe got two words out of him. But I said, do you know, um, Pete, what happened with Mark? And he told me, and he actually was talking to me and I would see him every day because he had become, a, a, he had joined into the work program within this church that would help people recover from addiction or whatever. And he was actually working at the church, kind of. So I would get to see him most days, and I would always make sure I talked to him. And it was just neat to see his progression. And there were other people, too, that I had seen the year before. So going two years in a row was real beneficial for me. Well, I don't know where to start. There were a lot of things that happened. I won't pick on Bob too much. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the neatest thing that we saw was um, when we gave out the food, you can't believe how much food we gave out. I would estimate the, the carts that we carried out would have averaged between 100 and 200 dollars worth of groceries. Mm. The people that were there the first time were the most impressive. Some of them even cried. But anyway, there were, there were really appreciative of all that they got. They just couldn't believe it. And uh, this one lady that I carried out for, they had a lot of these little uh, wire carts that they carried the groceries in, and she brought that cart. And um, she had, you had to go in and pick up your fruit and um, pastries and things first. And she had her cart oh, a little over half full, maybe. And then you come up to a line, and then you have to give them a number to tell how many are in your family or who's getting the food. And uh, that's where they handed out the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we had these carts. They had two and three shelves on them. And we had to have a big box on the top of the cart that they could fill with the food. And um, this lady got one big box full, and then the second um, box that she got was a different shape that they'd filled inside this room where they had the groceries. And when she got the two boxes full, I, I told her that, you know, you need to go outside so we can get out of the line. And I said, you can take me to your car, and um, she got outside. Uh, she kind of pulled over to the side, and she said, I don't have a car. Hmm. Well, I knew all. I knew all those groceries weren't going to fit in that car. Hmm. but. I took out all of the stuff that was going to get mashed out of her cart and left the vegetables in the bottom and the fruit and put it, unloaded the big box back in the middle of the cart and um, got all the heavy stuff in the bottom. And wouldn't you know it, that box 
that was a different shape. Remember when I did your car? You couldn't have made that box fit any better and it acted like sideboards on the cart. So we put all of the other stuff back in the top of the box and it all fit in. And she said she lived two or three blocks away. Well, <laughs> A little later on, when I pulled Kiroshi's out, she'd carried the cart across the parking lot and just got out in the street and the wheel fell off. Yep. And... I was gonna go and help her after I got my cart unloaded, but somebody from the church came out and they were out there putting the wheel back on her cart and they had to go get something else out of the church and she got got her cart fixed so she I guess she made it home after that. But just things like that. Yeah. I could tell you all kinds of stories. Hmm. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Julie. And we wonder if you're like me I remember our last night worshiping, and I said, when we get back to Painesville, we're going to be looking up someday, and we're going to wish we were back at Community United Methodist. Not because of the warm weather, that's an added bonus, but because goodness and mercy flows. Folks, you and I, we can't wave the magic wand and pay all the bills and put something in the bank and get rid of the depression that just bothers us at days and get rid of the relationship that keeps plaguing us or get rid of that thing, that surgery, whatever. We can't wave the magic wand, can we? But we can get up every morning and we can look for mercy and goodness. And we'd be just like this lady that had the cart that depends on that food each week and the wheel falls off, no big deal. Because the food was so heavy. And the mercy was heavier than the wheel. Surely, goodness and mercy. Before it was in earlier or middle of January and it was actually warm a little bit we had gone into a warmer spell and I was walking at night and the moon was just starting it was just beginning to be a full moon the full moon happened the last week of January or during that or mid last half of January but the moon was out and I was walking and I was looking up I was thinking it was a Saturday night all I could think about was what did I forget to do for Sunday morning am I ready is, this, is the message and I looked up and there were the stars and they were everywhere because there wasn't a cloud in the sky that night there was a huge moon and I realized surely God's mercy is with me Sometimes my life is a train wreck, but God's mercy always pursues me. Jesus answered them again. He said, I have told you, and you do not believe. And then he goes on, and he reminds them at the festival of dedication, a man-made ritual, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. Can't you just see the blind man smiling? And they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Can't you just see the blind man smiling? You can leperize me all you want. But I will believe because God's goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'm going to ask David to put up a song. It's called Breathe. It's been around for a while. You've heard it before. The words will be on the screen. Let's just let it speak to us because God's goodness and mercy is chasing us right now.